In a glorious tribute to its alumnus Ratan Tata, Cornell University said, the renowned industrialist generosity and concern for others enabled research that improved the education and health of millions of people of India. This documentary celebrates Ratan Tata's journey at Cornell University from 1955 to 1962, highlighting his time as a student and how Cornell shaped his future leadership, featuring vintage photos, archival footage, and interviews with 22 Cornellians, including classmates and fraternity brothers. The video offers a personal glimpse into Tata's academic and social life on campus. Created to honor his 50th reunion in June 2009, this piece explores enduring influence Cornell had on Tata's career and values. For more related contents, subscribe www.nullin.net. I'm David Scorton, President of Cornell University. Ratan Tata has made an enormous difference in Cornell University. Come with me. things and your heart will fly on wings forever when i went up for an interview it was a glorious spring day and it seemed that was where i wanted to go to school my first trip to the united states was when i was 11 years old or so when a friend of my father invited me to come and stay with them. He at that time was the Deputy Secretary of the United Nations. And I spent a month uh, at that time with him and his family in Long Island, uh, which is where the UN was, Lake Success, I think, before it moved into New York. And uh, it was as though I had always been here. It was a strange thing. I had absolutely no um, sense of having to adapt. And that reinforced the view that this is where I wanted to go to college. I came to the United States and to do my college board exams at Riverdale Country School. Riverdale was, in fact, when I was there, both a day school and a and a boarding school, they had a fairly large uh, international student body. The college boards were not given in India at that time and there was no other way you could enter undergraduate university uh, from India. And had it been possible that I, that I could have applied from India, I may not have gone to Cornell. Another factor that led to Cornell was people who were close to my father, Ted and Sylvia at Vinicombe, who in many ways in those early years were like my surrogate parents. The husband had been at the Cornell Hotel School. And in fact, when I was at Riverdale, I was up at various hotel meetings where he took me along and I think deep down inside, although he never pushed me, I think he wanted very much for me to go to Cornell. He was a vice president in uh, McCormick and Company, the spice and tea company in Baltimore. And in fact, that, that was like a, a home to me. That's where I went on Thanksgiving or Easter vacation and I learned so much about how to wash dishes, how to, um, how to make my bed, and all those things uh, with Ed and Sylvia at that time. I learned to drive in, in Baltimore. My first driver's license was a Maryland driver's license, and so on and so forth. With great, I would say, apprehension and yet great enthusiasm, I arrived at Cornell from India, I'd gone home for the summer vacation from, from Riverdale. I turned up at University Hall number six, which is where I was assigned. 
but the room was very pleasant and and uh, I still remember maybe a, a few minutes or a few hours after I checked in and and unpacked uh, this person came in and introduced himself as my dorm counselor Dick Barger in the hotel school and um, and then over th over that time, uh, both as a dorm counselor and as progressively as a friend, we we got to know each other. As part of my um, time at Cornell, for two years I was a dorm counselor in the men's dorms, uh, which is a combination of policeman and helper, beginning in the fall of 1955. Uh, one of uh, one of the single rooms right next to mine became occupied by Rotten Tata. That first week was a scary week. All of us had to wear these little red pick caps with 59 written on them. So th those early days were, were very difficult days. I wrote more letters home during that year than I did at any other time. So when one was homesick, it really meant you were cut off from home. There was a phone on in the corridor, or otherwise I think there was a pay phone down, downstairs in the dorms, which you'd have to use, and that was it. In the middle of the fall of the year, his father, Naval Tata, came to Cornell on a visit which he managed, I think came about every three or four months during that year that I was there. During the visit in the fall from Naval Tata, who happened to be either president or chairman of the International Labor Organization, which was an outgrowth of uh, League of Nations, and took him around the world for those years, well, the years that I knew him at least. He said, you know, you, Dick, you've got to come to India. And I thought to my, I said, oh, wouldn't that be fun? He said, I'm serious. I want you to come to India and I want to show you India as a way of thanking you for being so nice to my son. And so I asked Tom Merriweather from Akron and Bob Gerhardt from Philadelphia. And the three of us were the guests of the Tata family and resided in Tata House, which was uh, their private home right in the downtown uh, part of Bombay and presided over by Lady Tata, who was his grandmother was one of the most glorious, lovely women I've ever met in my life. It was her home and she treated us like preferred guests. I mean, uh, being a hotel student, I, uh, you know, I kind of noticed that. I was admitted in mechanical engineering to some extent because my father wanted me to be an engineer. And I really didn't enjoy mechanical engineering. I, on, on the one hand I did because uh, there were many things in, in engineering that I did and still do enjoy. But on the other hand there were many other things that I didn't. I had always wanted to be an architect and at the end of my, uh, my second year in, at Cornell I switched much to my father's consternation and upset. Uh, his dad wanted him to be an engineer, and the reason that his dad wanted him to be an engineer was uh, after World War II, and I don't know exactly how long after, but after World War II, his father had invited the Kaiser Corps of Engineers to come visit the Iron and Steel Works, and his father was vastly impressed, so his father wanted his, <laughs> his own son, Rutten, to be an engineer. Uh, I. I can understand that. Uh, I've been a father. Uh, on the other hand, Rutten wanted to be an architect. I just found it everything, everything that I had hoped that it would be. How does architecture really equip you to be in business? And I have found that that's all business is. You have a problem. At uh, conveyed to you, you to creatively think, think of solutions. All the 
miles of tracing paper that all of us wasted in one concept after another did one thing. It taught us that we didn't stick with one thing. We, we tried and we tried and we improved and we reconceived what we had to do. It's no different in business. If your mind doesn't think that way, go down one track and, and I have found very, very many times that that training has, has helped me. If I've been able to do anything in, in the product area, it's because I have worked with materials. I can interact with design engineers in terms of telling that there's a problem in this corner. How will you deal with this? And then finally, you have to have somewhat of an aesthetic eye to be able to think of what people will, how they will like the product you have or what, whatever you've done. All of which goes back to what we, what we studied um, in those five years. And so he took the work seriously and did a good job and uh, the work, his projects were rewarded and, and indeed he was at a high level in the class. So member of the honoraries, well respected in terms of as a person and a designer. Rotten was very good. He would have been a terrific architect. He, he would have been a, he would have had an incredibly successful architecture practice if that's what he did. The thing I remember about Rotten's thesis project was is that it was uh, done very much in the Le Corbusier style. Uh, was a, I believe a high-rise office building that, that turned out very nicely. I think he was a very good, Rotten was a very good architectural designer. And as I recall, Rotan got a commended uh, grade on the project under the old Beaux-Arts system. Rotan took to this immediately. It was a very, very quick study and had excellent taste and good design sense and uh, fell right into this group, although he had been working as an engineer for two or three years. And incidentally, over the years, I've had a lot of good uh, students come from engineering to take courses. As one of them once said, I took an engineering so I could build things and all I've done is draw and do mathematics. He got along awfully well with other people. He was well liked and uh, just generally started to show all the symptoms of becoming a very effective, very uh, productive uh, person when he was just a kid. You know, the end of your freshman year, everybody got rushed to join a fraternity. Joining a fraternity made you feel that you, you belong, belonged somewhere to a smaller group. I think the important thing is you became a part of a smaller ecosystem. One of the things that we were expected to do as pledges is to pull a raid on the fraternity house. Um, and so one night we went there, I say night, it was about two, three in the morning, and son of a gun, somebody was reading a magazine in the library, and it was Rotten Tata. So we had to kidnap him, so we had to tie him up. I don't remember what we did to him. I'm sure we didn't, um, you know, ask for ransom or anything like that, but he was a brother, and we were pledges. Now, this is my pledge paddle, and all of us um, in my year had to make a paddle on the back Everybody at the time that could signed. And so all my pledge brothers, my pledge brothers signed at the bottom, and then different um, oh, brothers signed at the top. And I do have Rotten Tata's name there, I'm pleased to say. We met uh, Rotten when we were pledging. And then uh, I remember in 1957, um, his father came to uh, New York City. And while he was there, he came up to Ithaca to visit Rotan at the fraternity, and the fraternity kind of went all out, wanted to be, you know, spit and polished. And the fraternity had a large oval table where the officers sat at dinner, and I can still remember Rotan's father sitting there for dinner. Oh, I guess I enjoyed being in Alpha Sigma Phi very much. It was a great fraternity, a nice bunch of fellows, and uh, we all got along very well, and uh, Rotan certainly was part of that at great parties and uh, I was steward for the house for a while and uh, we did hopefully have some good meals. Nobody died of food poisoning. But uh, <laughs> so it was good for me and uh, I enjoyed it very much.
and uh, it was a nice way to socialize and get to know some people. And the girls were great too. In the spring of '58, I was having difficulty with a, a course, a very hard course. Uh, I think it was plant physiology, and Rakan helped me reorganize my uh, study hours during the week and um, help me spend uh, uh, the proper amount of time on all my courses, which brought all of my marks up. And I'll be forever grateful to him for that. A bunch of us got together to decide to have a pledge rate on the house with uh, uh, various things to wake up the brotherhood and send them a message. So uh, late very late one night, uh, had a raid on the house. The Brotherhood woke up, came tumbling downstairs, and this big rumble ensued. And uh, finally, you know, we were outnumbered by the uh, actives uh, living in the house, and uh, they, they had us subdued. So the, the usual calisthenics followed, and then we had to clean up the house. And uh, uh, later, on our way back to University Halls, uh, Bob Allen made the comment, boy, that Tata was everywhere. I guess he had, Tata had just wrestled him to the ground and, and subdued him. And, uh, and it must have been, of course, he has, I think he either has or has, has or had very good reflexes and must have known something about martial arts because uh, he, he had no trouble <laughs> subduing Bob Allen and probably several other people too. It was September of 2002. So we took him to the fraternity, Rockledge. It was a little before noon. We rang the doorbell. There was no one there. A work person came out of a side entrance and said, you know, you can get in through here. So we went in, looked around the building, and Ratan was really, really happy. They were looking at his old fraternity and especially looking at all the pictures. On the way out, a young man came in and looked at us very suspiciously because we were three strangers. Turned out he was the president of the fraternity. So I introduced myself, saying I was dean of architecture, and here was an alumnus of my college and his fraternity, Mr. Tata. The young man looks at him, extends his hand and says, oh, rotten. So clearly, I guess, uh, I'm not a fraternity person, but brothers are schooled about who the great alumni are, so they've been taught about Tata. After living two years in, in the fraternity, I, I moved to an apartment downtown in, in Ithaca and Rutten decided he would like to be my roommate. Got his stuff and began moving in, and he got all moved in. I said, okay, now we, we better go to the grocery store. And Rutten looked at me like I was nuts. He said, grocery store? I said, yeah. He said, I don't go to grocery stores. <laughs> I said, you don't, huh? Well, in that case, you don't eat because we're gonna have to get groceries in this place to feed you. And if you're not going to participate in purchasing them, you're not going to have any to eat. And one of the things that we used to do that I thought was a lot of fun, he did too, was we would, Saturday mornings, we didn't have, a, we, we had a little bit of loose time. And so we would have coffee and toast. And we would do what, he and I would do what we call giant toast-a-thons. And we could just sit and pop toast down and eat two-thirds of a loaf, half a loaf, most of a loaf of bread two of just sitting there talking and drinking coffee and eating toast. Uh, 113 West Lincoln Street was uh, down the hill from the university and uh, uh, just south of uh, the uh, south end of Cayuga Lake. And uh, this was a small house. There was an apartment upstairs, an apartment downstairs. Uh, Bob Allen and Rotan lived upstairs. Bruce Herbert and I lived downstairs. We were um, all members of Alpha Sigma Phi fraternity. Bruce had this uh, obnoxious theater organ record that he delighted in playing very loudly. So one night in the dark, Rotan came down while Bruce was playing that and grabbed Bruce's record off of that, switched it out with his own record and broke the other record to pieces. And uh, um, we didn't quite know what had happened then until Rotan pointed out that, uh, that you know, that was a, another record that he had brought downstairs. Never did get used to the cold at Cornell. Um... I couldn't ever feel warm enough. The first day I saw snow, I spent the whole day out in the snow. I thought it was fantastic. And the, that ended very fast. And then 
snowmen trudging with wet shoes and sitting in hot classes with water melting and it meant sliding up and down those slopes next to the gorge when you went for lunch or went up to class. And I vowed that I would never live in a cold climate again. I went skiing once in my life uh, with my roommate Ken Kewen because uh, he w became an avid skier and uh, I spent most of that afternoon on my backside sliding down uh, having fallen. And there's Rutten with my skis as a, and I'd asked him to hang on to them and he, he was hanging on to them and he had them up in front of him like this and uh, when I looked closely there was something going on and what he had done was he had stuck his tongue to the steel edge on the ski and it was stuck. <laughs> and it took us a little time and ingenuity, but we got his tongue unstuck <laughs> without injury. Rotten's relationship to cold was a a hate-hate relationship. Uh, he was a, very much a warm climate kind of person, I think. Another memory I have is, is actually having a Rotten come to my house. And it was a early American, authentic, center chimney colonial that had yet to see any insulation and it was in the dead of winter. So he stayed there that night and Rotten told me that uh, that uh, sleepover that we had that weekend was probably the coldest night in bed he'd ever spent <laughs> because it was so, it was a very uh, classic New England thing. Maybe he learned a little bit about uh, the American frontier from that experience himself, I don't know. In those days, uh, foreign exchange is very difficult to come by and the Reserve Bank of India would allocate a certain amount of dollars for your studies. I remember that amount was like $180 a, a month. And uh, there used to be times when you'd get very close to the wire and the check would be delayed coming in or something would happen and uh, there were a couple of times I actually with great humiliation had to go and ask my friends if they could lend me a hundred dollars to get over time till my check came or something. So it was very tough. I used to supplement this uh, by washing planes at the airport uh, or getting, you know, washing planes so that I could get flying time and things of this nature that I, that I did. I related to him in uh, a lot of different ways, but I guess one of them was the fact that we were both foreign students at the time. I remember at one time uh, somebody told me that uh, Ratan has got a pair of cufflinks and for some reason it stuck in my mind that it was like a ruby cufflinks and because the uh, foreign students at that time lived on a limited budget when you get your money you have to live with it and make it last and sometimes you know it wasn't easy you know to transfer money and, uh, so the bottom line was that uh, Ratan you know like was short of cash and he had a pair of cufflinks and he wanted to sell it and uh, the idea was that, you know, uh, if I would be interested, well, I had my limitations too. The bottom line is I didn't get the cufflinks. Now I'm looking back and I'm thinking, you know what? I wish I had uh, gotten those cufflinks because after 50 years, boy, that must have a real sentimental value to him. <laughs> that he was short of cash, he needs money, he has to sell his cufflinks. And if I could have held on to that, and send it back after 50 years, say, Ratan, this is a gift after 50 years. I'm sure it has a very sentimental value for you. We all spent many long hours into the night in Sibley Hall uh, in the drafting rooms. And so every now and then we needed a break. Uh, and one of the, one of the things that, uh, that, that Ratan brought to the whole thing was the hand slapping game. And it goes like this. The uh, one person puts his hands out the other puts his hands on them, and the, the whole idea is to see how quick you can slap the other person or they can move their hands. 
Well, Rotan has incredibly good reflexes and just used to beat the heck out of everybody else when, when he was the person with his hands underneath. Rotten. If, if you wonder why I have such small shriveled hands, it's because they got beaten to death all those years when we did it. Rod was just really good at it. I came back just for the few days of graduation, and I didn't need to, but I, I thought of graduating from an American university, I should come and wear the cap and gown and, and go through whatever there was, so I came back. And it was quite a memorable occasion and nice to say the final goodbye or bye-bye to the people you'd been through so much of life with for five years. When I did get a car, it was uh, by college standards quite a fancy car because it was a little black Mercedes and probably the blackest Mercedes in, in Ithaca because I really looked after it. He didn't have money to buy a car, but the family had a joint venture with Mercedes uh, building trucks in India. So I can't remember what year, junior or senior year, they, they got a small Mercedes shipped to him from, from Germany, which of course we were all just, wow. Because I had this black Mercedes, it lent itself to the image of being a limousine. Particularly after he got his Mercedes, he kept bugging all of us. He wanted to uh, act like he was the chauffeur and he even got a this little blue chauffeur's cap. Oh, when Rattan was a student I had a convertible Jaguar that he seemed to like and uh, so we would talk occasionally about sports cars because he had quite an interest in sports cars. And so I went up to him and I said, sir, I apologize for intruding on you, but how do you keep your car so well in, in the winter time with all the salt, etc., on the road? Because I said, I have a Mercedes and I'm deadly afraid of uh, it rusting. The answer for me was very simple. I put it in storage in Dean's warehouse for the winter <laughs> and bought an old junker to go with my regular car. And, uh... and he said, you know what I do is I buy a, a clunker every winter time. And I put my car up on blocks and uh, at the end of the winter I take it down and that's how I keep my car the way it is. And he said, you won't lose very much money on it. You buy it and you can resell it in the spring for almost the same amount. And that's what I went and did. Rotten Tata was the first person that I ever knew um, about my age that had two cars. Yeah, his, his car was like this black onyx gem. And it was meant to be treated as such. Rotten had a used Mercedes-Benz. I had never seen a Mercedes-Benz before and uh, Rotten was very particular about how you closed the door on the Mercedes-Benz. In those days uh, I was partial to Ford Motor Company products and when you in the this was in the 50s and uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, in those days uh, you really slammed the four door shut to make sure that it was shut. Uh, that was part of the drill and boy when I turned around and I slammed that door of that Mercedes, uh, Rotten got quite upset about that and <laughs> he said, you know, a Mercedes you really just, you close the door, you don't slam it. If you slammed the door, if you were persona non grata. When he got this car, I still remember where pulled into the driveway at the fraternity house and a, a steep hill down and he asked everybody to get out, which others did too with their cars. And I was sitting in the front seat. I got out and I did what anybody does with a car. They slammed the door at the time because the latches didn't work. And you'd think I had killed somebody. Don't slam the door! And after that, once we all got used to the idea we're not supposed to slam the door, still, when you go to get out of the car before you get out, don't slam the door. And, and you know, somebody new would get in, the uninitiated, and, and get Rotten's wrath over slamming the door. It was, uh, we all laughed about it all the time. We, you know, we'd start saying to him when he'd get out of the car, Rotten, don't slam the door. 
All the time I had it, I didn't even have a flat tire on it. I never changed a tire, nothing. A few things happened to the engine, which I fixed myself. I sold my car to, uh, I think, another, another architect. You said, I have a car, it's a Mercedes sedan, uh, and uh, if you're interested, uh, I have to sell it. So and if you need a car, you know, um, you know, you can get a good price on it. Uh, so he offered to show it to me, and I said, fine. And we went down, and it was late winter, and uh, he had it stored in a little garage. It was jacked up on concrete blocks so that the tires would be preserved. It was stored so it wouldn't be uh, damaged by the uh, the salt heavily used on Ithaca roads uh, so and all the fluids been drained it was in perfect pristine condition and and I sold him this pristine car I think someone called Newman and I remember so well in January of 1962 Rutten Tata came into the drafting room into the architectural drafting room and there were several of us working there and he said anybody want to buy my car and somebody said, well, how much do you want for it? And he said, $300. And everybody said, wow, that's a lot of money. And I thought, you know, that's really a pretty good deal. And so I went to Rutten and I said, you know, I might be interested in your car and I'd like to see it. And he showed me the car and it was in, in mint condition. He took very good care of it. And so I didn't have $300 either, but I managed to borrow it from my fiance and uh, paid Rutten $300, and off I went on my honeymoon in my $300 black Mercedes. Flying was uh, my love and joy. I started flying when I was 14 in India, and I could not solo because I was underage. Flying has a lot of crazy things. I went to summer school one year, and it was, I wished Every year at Cornell was like summer school because it was a lovely time of the year. Very difficult to remain in, in class. But it was only design. So you were on your own for most part. You could work in the night and uh, be in the lake in the, in the daytime or do what you wanted. And, uh, that was a lovely time to fly also. So it was a great a great summer. There used to be a little airport uh, downtown next to the lake. That's where I took flying lessons, that's where I soloed. And I flew there for a period of time and then towards the latter part I moved to the bigger airport, Tompkins County Airport. Oh, I used to often uh, try to get some of my classmates to come up and and savor the, the enjoyment or excitement of flying. At times I used to try to scare some of them, but most of the time it was just to give them another vista and, and often to have them share the cost of, of flying for me. One day Rotten invited me to go flying with him because he, was, uh, he had to put in a certain number of hours in order to get a certain level of, of, of uh, pilot's license. So we went flying and went out to the airport and, uh, and uh, went flying and it was, it was terrific. The first time I'd ever been in a small plane and it had this wonderful feeling. And he was a very serious pilot, really dedicated to, to being a better pilot. And we did stalls, which just terrified me, doing the stall, which is, which is taking the plane up to a, to a certain climbing altitude to the engine stops. And because the weight in these small planes is all in the engine in the front, the plane goes boop very, very quickly. That was one of the scarier moments of my life. Rotten's father was coming in uh, to town on business and he wanted to fly down to meet him. So we took a Tri-Pacer, which was a single engine, four seat plane, very small, very lightweight. And his instructor was named Adrian Bugley and there was Rotten and in the front seat obviously doing some of the flying and in the back seat was Fred Klein and myself. We went down to uh, New York to meet uh, Rotten's uh, father. We go through the landing pattern routine and we are on our way down to the runway and all of a sudden the uh, speaker in the plane goes 
uh, Idlewild Tower. This is, I don't know what it was, TWA, DC-7B. There's a tripacer in my path, and we all go <laughs> like that, looking out back. And here was, you know, this huge airplane. It was a pretty big airplane at the time. Just enormous plane, uh, what looked like right behind us. And very calmly, the tower said, DC-7B, move left to runway 2A, or whatever it was. And we're going, <laughs> And, and land, and then in a little plane in that, that size airport, you can't see where you, you have to go. Uh, they finally told us to just stop, and, uh, and finally a, uh, a follow me truck uh, uh, met us and got us back to the gate. After that, I decided not to go into airports like Kennedy. I remember that day, and uh, we were in the drafting room working on an architectural project and Ratan asked if anybody was, wanted to take a break and go fly with him. Charlie Green, Nan Otterson and myself took his offer and pretty soon we were far above Cayuga's waters enjoying the beautiful scenery from a rented tri pacer single engine plane. Mo and I were in the rear seats and Charlie was in the co-pilot position. When we got up over Sibley, Tata said, oh, look at the dome. There's Sibley's dome, where we all should have been. And the next moment, it seemed like the whole plane was uh, shaking itself apart. And, and then the prop stopped. And I realized we had no engine. There was dead silence outside the plane, inside the plane, too. I didn't know what was going on. I just saw Rattan moving levers and trying to control the plane. And when I leaned forward to see what was going on, I saw the propeller that was frozen. I decided that I would try to land on the first place I saw, which was uh, the practice field next to the stadium. And then I realized that all these people were practicing for the football game and I'd come in and kill them all because there was no sound. So then I decided I'd try to make the airport. And I remember Ratan turning back to us and saying that uh, we were high enough uh, to make a forced landing at the runway in the airport. I turned towards Nan and I saw her sinking as far as she could into her seat. And I didn't get scared. I just wanted to see what Ratan was going to do. And then I heard him make the May Day call. And then I knew we were really in trouble. And then all of a sudden, I saw the tree line coming up. And I looked over at Mo Benchom. And he looked at me. We didn't say a word. Neither did Charlie Green. But I was sure we were going to end up in the trees and then all of a sudden we came down and we were at the airport. It was a miracle. <laughs> and I made the airport but the wrong side of the airport and uh, I know there was a Mohawk Airlines plane coming in the other way and I flicked on my landing lights and, and landed. He went around and we I made probably the best landing I've ever made and uh, rolled onto the taxiway, turned off the runway and, and then got everybody to get out and push the plane because there was, no, there was no engine. And we had this big Mohawk plane behind us sort of bearing down on us, uh, trying to get us out of the way because he had to go around and come back. Uh, Ratan asked the, the guy in the control tower that, uh, why he hadn't answered his calls. And the guy said that he had gone out for a coke. So then he went to the guy he rented the airplane from, and uh, he said that uh, if he wanted his plane back, he had to get it at the end of the runway. And the guy just said, well, that's better than fishing it out of Cayuga Lake. For many years, I had this piston with a hole in it sitting on my desk. And I was very grateful for Tata's calmness in the situation and his skill in getting us all down. And I thanked him very much for this.
I thought a, a gift that would enable young Indian students to have an education at Cornell was an important thing. And to have Cornell have more Indian students uh, who applied but didn't have uh, uh, finances would be a good thing both for Cornell and for India. As a member of, uh, of this administration, uh, and in particular uh, working on energy issues, uh, we have had a lot of activity and I've had a lot of opportunity to talk with Ratan in particular about the, uh, the evolving cooperative relationship on civil nuclear power that we have had between the U.S. government and the Indian government. One of the most notable ones was when Rotten was given an award uh, by Auburn University and the location of it was the UN. It was incredibly special. The person who gave him the award was Henry Kissinger and Henry Kissinger spoke eloquently about his entire career and, and what it had meant and what a real statesman uh, he has been. Um, and I, that was just, I mean, for me, that was just, I was so thrilled to be there. And I know Rotten Tata because we served together for more than a decade on the Ford Foundation Board of Directors. He is a man of extraordinary humility and humanity. When uh, Rotten would talk to and interject uh, at a director's meeting, um, he was always listened to with uh, uh, very closely. I um, came to know um, Ratan Tata, when he was invited to join the board of trustees at Cornell. And he's a, a gentleman of few words. He's out there, he's listening, and when he says something, he, he says it with a great deal of uh, forethought and pragmatism. What he has done for the university with his great gift of $50 million towards um, research and towards scholarship it's just a wonderful thing. I know, I know Ratan first from his reputation, from having read about him all these years, from having seen articles about him, and realizing this was a person who, in business, I really admired. Having joined the Cornell board and then having him join a year later, uh, I got to meet him in person and really came to admire him even more, not, not just for his overall uh, accomplishments, but also for the fact that here is a person who is a citizen of the world, but he's also a citizen for Cornell. I admire him very much for his generosity and having just given the uh, what was one of the largest gifts in the um, history of the university, I am very happy to have him and at least many more behind him top me so that my, my gift will, will get lower on the charts in terms of the size. Rotten has taught me the importance of Cornell for the people of India. He is very interested in the light being shined on the people behind him who are getting the work done. And so I think he reminds us to be more humble and to keep our eye on the goal and not in the mirror. I took my first trip to India in January of 07 uh, under the guidance of Ratan Tata. Ratan played an enormous role in preparing me for the trip. Ratan opened many doors for us in India and with him we spent uh, 90 minutes with Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister of India. I'm honored to be Ratan's student of India. Getting through Cornell gave you a sense of achievement. You made a lot of good friends. Those years at Cornell were probably the best investment that one could have made in time. I had a chance to visit Tata in Bombay and I just had a, a wonderful time there in, in Bombay for a week or so, uh, uh, midsummer of, uh, geez, that was 61. I found a couple of letters that I'd written to Tata. Really rotten, I, I don't know how a foreigner, or rather a Westerner, could face Bombay straight off an airplane without friends in the city. And believe me, I do appreciate having been you know, in your hands, so to speak. 
I can assure you that I verily strut about with my new raw silk jacket. Uh, Davy, his tailor, uh, did a real nice job on it, and thanks a lot for arranging for it to be at the Bombay International Airport uh, to meet me. I just considered him a pal. He's still my friend and uh, always will be. I have great, great memories. And he was one of the highlights of my uh, time at Cornell. There are a few people in my world that I think of as friends and always will think of as friends. And not friends that went away, just friends. People that I am close to, that I'm a soulmate with, and he's one. I feel very lucky to know Ratan Tata, and I know him at, a, at only a friendship level. And there can be years between times that we get together, and it doesn't seem to matter. Ratan Tata, is, is, I'm proud to say he's a friend of mine. He shared a, a, um, an, an ability with me about friendship. It was that willingness to be a good friend with people uh, right from the heart when you're with them. And then if you miss them and don't see them for months, you can pick right up where you left off. Although having met a good many special people in, throughout my life, he is, he's a very special person. I know, I can tell. And you know, even when uh, way, way back there in Alpha Sigma Phi, I could tell that he was a, he was a very special Person. He's always been a real gung-ho Cornelian. I mean, from the day I met him, the charm of Ratan is not only that he's this world-famous gent, but he's a real, you know, he's a real mensch. The memories from Cornell, you know, will have and will stick with me forever. Ratan's a friend and always will be. We lived together in the in the uh, Sibley Hall from crack of dawn to midnight when they kicked us out and uh, so uh, we were all really family and I felt we were all close friends. You almost over the period of years you become like a little family. When you do projects, when you do overnights, you know, and then you spend time together, everybody sort of like uh, clings together. He was an architectural student, somebody who lived just like any of, anyone else over there. Now he's, uh, oh my God, he's on top of the world, but it's the same old Ratan Tata. Same old Ratan Tata. And he had a great sense of humor, and he liked joking about himself. He'd joke about his name, um, his way of saying goodbye with Tata. <laughs> Treasure is